Old English, Wikipedia article audio. Old English, or Anglo-Saxon, is the earliest historical form of the English language, spoken in England and southern and eastern Scotland in the early Middle Ages. It was brought to Great Britain by Anglo-Saxon settlers probably in the mid-5th century, and the first Old English literary works date from the mid-7th century. After the Norman conquest of 1066, English was replaced, for a time, as the language of the upper classes by Anglo-Norman, a relative of French. This is regarded as marking the end of the Old English era, as during this period the English language was heavily influenced by Anglo-Norman, developing into a phase known now as Middle English. Terminology History Dialects Influence of other languages Phonology Sound changes Grammar Morphology Syntax Orthography Literature Beowulf The Lord's Prayer Charter of Nut Revivals Notes Bibliography Old English developed from a set of Anglo-Frisian or Ingvianic dialects originally spoken by Germanic tribes traditionally known as the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. As the Anglo-Saxons became dominant in England, their language replaced the languages of Roman Britain, Common Britonic, a Celtic language, and Latin, brought to Britain by Roman invasion. Old English had four main dialects, associated with particular Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, Mercian, Northumbrian, Kentish, and West Saxon. It was West Saxon that formed the basis for the literary standard of the later Old English period, although the dominant forms of Middle and Modern English would develop mainly from Mercian. The speech of eastern and northern parts of England was subject to strong Old Norse influence due to Scandinavian rule and settlement beginning in the 9th century. Old English is one of the West Germanic languages, and its closest relatives are Old Frisian and Old Saxon. Like other Old Germanic languages, it is very different from modern English and difficult for modern English speakers to understand without study. Old English grammar is quite similar to that of modern German, nouns, adjectives, pronouns, and verbs have many inflectional endings and forms, and word order is much freer. The oldest Old English inscriptions were written using a runic system, but from about the 9th century this was replaced by a version of the Latin alphabet. Inglisk, which the term English is derived from means pertaining to the Angles. In Old English, this word was derived from Angles. During the 9th century, all invading Germanic tribes were referred to as Inglisk. It has been hypothesis that the Angles acquired their name because their land on the coast of Jutland resembled a fish hook. Proto-Germanic asterisk Angus also had the meaning of narrow, referring to the shallow waters near the coast. That word ultimately goes back to Proto-Indo-European asterisk HN, also meaning narrow. Another theory is that the derivation of narrow is the more likely connection to angling, which itself stems from a pi root meaning bend, angle. The semantic link is the fishing hook, which is curved or bent at an angle. In any case, the Angles may have been called such because they were a fishing people or were originally descended from such, and therefore England would mean land of the fishermen, and English would be the fishermen's language. Old English was not static, and its usage covered a period of 700 years, from the Anglo-Saxon settlement of Britain in the 5th century to the late 11th century, some time after the Norman invasion. 
While indicating that the establishment of dates is an arbitrary process, Albert Bow dates Old English from 450 to 1150, a period of full inflections, a synthetic language. Perhaps around 85% of Old English words are no longer in use, but those that survived are basic elements of modern English vocabulary. Old English is a West Germanic language, developing out of Ingvionic dialects from the 5th century. It came to be spoken over most of the territory of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms which became the Kingdom of England. This included most of present-day England, as well as part of what is now southeastern Scotland, which for several centuries belonged to the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria. Other parts of the island Wales and most of Scotland continued to use Celtic languages, except in the areas of Scandinavian settlements where Old Norse was spoken. Celtic speech also remained established in certain parts of England. Medieval Cornish was spoken all over Cornwall and in adjacent parts of Devon, while Cumbric survived perhaps to the 12th century in parts of Cumbria, and Welsh may have been spoken on the English side of the Anglo-Welsh border. Norse was also widely spoken in the parts of England which fell under Danish law. Anglo-Saxon literacy developed after Christianization in the late 7th century. The oldest surviving text of Old English literature is Cadman's Hymn, composed between 658 and 680. There is a limited corpus of runic inscriptions from the 5th to 7th centuries, but the oldest coherent runic texts date to the 8th century. The Old English Latin alphabet was introduced around the 9th century. With the unification of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms by Alfred the Great in the later 9th century, the language of government and literature became standardized around the West Saxon dialect. Alfred advocated education in English alongside Latin, and had many works translated into the English language, some of them, such as Pope Gregory I.S. Treatise Pastoral Care appear to have been translated by Alfred himself. In Old English, typical of the development of literature, poetry arose before prose, but King Alfred the Great chiefly inspired the growth of prose. A later literary standard, dating from the later 10th century, arose under the influence of Bishop Ethelwold of Winchester and was followed by such writers as the prolific Alfric of Incham. This form of the language is known as the Winchester Standard, or more commonly as Late West Saxon. It is considered to represent the classical form of Old English. It retained its position of prestige until the time of the Norman Conquest, after which English ceased for a time to be of importance as a literary language. The history of Old English can be subdivided into The Old English period is followed by Middle English, Early Modern English and finally Modern English. Old English should not be regarded as a single monolithic entity, just as Modern English is also not monolithic. It emerged over time out of the many dialects and languages of the colonizing tribes and it is only towards the later Anglo-Saxon period that these can be considered to have constituted a single national language. Even then, Old English continued to exhibit much local and regional variation, remnants of which remain in modern English dialects. The four main dialectal forms of Old English were Mercian, Northumbrian, Kentish, and West Saxon. Mercian and Northumbrian are together referred to as Anglian. In terms of geography the Northumbrian region lay north of the Humber River, the Mercian lay north of the Thames and south of the Humber River, West Saxon lay south and southwest of the Thames, and the smallest, Kentish region lay southeast of the Thames, a small corner of England. The Kentish region, settled by the Jutes from Jutland, 
has the scantiest literary remains. Each of these four dialects was associated with an independent kingdom on the island. Of these, Northumbria south of the Tyne, and most of Mercia, were overrun by the Vikings during the 9th century. The portion of Mercia that was successfully defended, and all of Kent, were then integrated into Wessex under Alfred the Great. From that time on, the West Saxon dialect became standardized as the language of government, and as the basis for the many works of literature and religious materials produced or translated from Latin in that period. The later literary standard known as Late West Saxon, although centered in the same region of the country, appears not to have been directly descended from Alfred's early West Saxon. For example, the former diphthong slash e slash tended to become monophthongist to slash i slash in use, but to slash y slash in lws. Due to the centralization of power and the Viking invasions, there is relatively little written record of the non-Wessex dialects after Alfred's unification. Some Mercian texts continued to be written, however, and the influence of Mercian is apparent in some of the translations produced under Alfred's program, many of which were produced by Mercian scholars. Other dialects certainly continued to be spoken, as is evidenced by the continued variation between their successors in Middle and Modern English. In fact, what would become the standard forms of Middle English and of Modern English are descended from Mercian rather than West Saxon, while Scots developed from the Northumbrian dialect. It was once claimed that, owing to its position at the heart of the Kingdom of Wessex, the relics of Anglo-Saxon accent, idiom and vocabulary were best preserved in the dialect of Somerset. For details of the sound differences between the dialects, see Phonological History of Old English. The language of the Anglo-Saxon settlers appears not to have been significantly affected by the native British Celtic languages which it largely displaced. The number of Celtic loanwords introduced into the language is very small. However, Various suggestions have been made concerning possible influence that Celtic may have had on developments in English syntax in the post-Old English period, such as the regular progressive construction and analytic word order, as well as the eventual development of the paraphrastic auxiliary verb do. Old English contained a certain number of loanwords from Latin, which was the scholarly and diplomatic lingua franca of Western Europe. It is sometimes possible to give approximate dates for the borrowing of individual Latin words based on which patterns of sound change they have undergone. Some Latin words had already been borrowed into the Germanic languages before the ancestral Angles and Saxons left continental Europe for Britain. More entered the language when the Anglo-Saxons were converted to Christianity and Latin-speaking priests became influential. It was also through Irish Christian missionaries that the Latin alphabet was introduced and adapted for the writing of Old English, replacing the earlier runic system. Nonetheless, the largest transfer of Latin-based words into English occurred after the Norman Conquest of 1066, and thus in the Middle English rather than the Old English period. Another source of loan words was Old Norse which came into contact with Old English via the Scandinavian rulers and settlers in the Danelaw from the late 9th century, and during the rule of Nut and other Danish kings in the early 11th century. Many place names in eastern and northern England are of Scandinavian origin. Norse borrowings are relatively rare in Old English literature, being mostly terms relating to government and administration. The literary standard, however, was based on the West Saxon dialect, away from the main area of Scandinavian influence, the impact of Norse may have been greater in the Eastern and Northern dialects. Certainly in Middle English texts, 
which are more often based on Eastern dialects, a strong Norse influence becomes apparent. Modern English contains a great many, often everyday, words that were borrowed from Old Norse, and the grammatical simplification that occurred after the Old English period is also often attributed to Norse influence. The influence of Old Norse certainly helped move English from a synthetic language along the continuum to a more analytic word order, and Old Norse most likely made a greater impact on the English language than any other language. The eagerness of Vikings in the Danelaw to communicate with their southern Anglo-Saxon neighbors produced a friction that led to the erosion of the complicated inflectional word endings. Simeon Potter notes, no less far-reaching was the influence of Scandinavian upon the inflectional endings of English in hastening that wearing away and leveling of grammatical forms which gradually spread from north to south. It was, after all, a salutary influence. The gain was greater than the loss. There was a gain in directness, in clarity, and in strength. The strength of the Viking influence on Old English appears from the fact that the indispensable elements of the language pronouns, modals, comparatives, pronominal adverbs, conjunctions and prepositions show the most marked Danish influence, the best evidence of Scandinavian influence appears in the extensive word borrowings for, as Jesperson indicates, no texts exist in either Scandinavia or in northern England from this time to give certain evidence of an influence on syntax. The change to Old English from Old Norse was substantive, pervasive, and of a democratic character. Old Norse and Old English resembled each other closely like cousins and with some words in common, they roughly understood each other in time the inflections melted away and the analytic pattern emerged. It is most important to recognize that in many words the English and Scandinavian language differed chiefly in their inflectional elements. The body of the word was so nearly the same in the two languages that only the endings would put obstacles in the way of mutual understanding. In the mixed population which existed in the Danelaw these endings must have led to much confusion, tending gradually to become obscured and finally lost. This blending of peoples and languages resulted in simplifying English grammar. The inventory of classical Old English surface phones, as usually reconstructed, is as follows. The sounds enclosed in parentheses in the chart above are not considered to be phonemes. The above system is largely similar to that of modern English, except that for most speakers have generally been lost, while the voiced affricate and fricatives have become independent phonemes, as has slash slash. The mid-front rounded vowels slash slash had merged into unrounded slash e slash before the late West Saxon period. During the 11th century such vowels arose again, as monophthongisations of the diphthong slash e o slash, but quickly merged again with slash e slash in most dialects. The exact pronunciation of the West Saxon closed diphthongs, spelt i.e., is disputed, it may have been slash e slash or slash i e slash. Other dialects may have had different systems of diphthongs, for example, Anglian dialects retain slash i u slash, which had merged with slash e o slash in West Saxon. For more on dialectal differences, see Phonological History of Old English. Some of the principal sound changes occurring in the prehistory and history of Old English were the following. Prehistoric Old English For this period, Old English is mostly a reconstructed language as no literary witnesses survive. This language, or block of languages, spoken by the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes, and predating documented Old English or Anglo Saxon, has also been called Primitive Old English, Early Old English, 
the period of the oldest manuscript traditions, with authors such as Cadman, Bede, Kinnewulf, and Aldhelm, late Old English, the final stage of the language leading up to the Norman conquest of England and the subsequent transition to early Middle English, is an allophone of slash j slash occurring after slash n slash n when geminated, is an allophone of slash n slash occurring before slash k slash n slash slash dot, are voiced allophones of slash f, theta, s slash respectively, occurring between vowels or voiced consonants, are allophones of slash h slash occurring in coda position after front and back vowels respectively, is an allophone of slash slash occurring after a vowel, and, at an earlier stage of the language, in the syllable onset, the voiceless sonorants are analyzed as realizing the sequences slash hw, hl, hn, hr slash. Fronting of to accept when nasalized or followed by a nasal consonant, partly reversed in certain positions by later a restoration or retraction, monophthongization of the diphthong, and modification of remaining diphthongs to the height harmonic type, diphthongization of long and short front vowels in certain positions, palatalization of velars to in certain front vowel environments, the process known as I mutation, loss of certain weak vowels in word final and medial positions, and of medial j, reduction of remaining unstressed vowels, diphthongization of certain vowels before certain consonants when preceding a back vowel, loss of slash h slash between vowels or between a voiced consonant and a vowel, with lengthening of the preceding vowel, collapse of two consecutive vowels into a single vowel, palatal umlaut, which has given forms such as six. Default word order is verb second in main clauses, and verb final in subordinate clauses, being more like modern German than modern English, no due support in questions and negatives. Questions were usually formed by inverting subject and finite verb, and negatives by placing NE before the finite verb, regardless what verb, multiple negatives can stack up in a sentence intensifying each other. Sentences with subordinate clauses of the type when X, Y don't use a WH type conjunction, but rather a TH type correlative conjunction such as A with Macron, otherwise meaning then. The WH words are used only as interrogatives and as indefinite pronouns, similarly, WH forms were not used as relative pronouns. Instead, the indeclinable word e is used, often preceded by the appropriate form of the article slash demonstrative sc. For more details of these processes, see the main article, linked above. For sound changes before and after the Old English period, see Phonological History of English. Nouns decline for five cases, nominative, accusative, Genitive, dative, instrumental, three genders, masculine, feminine, neuter, and two numbers, singular and plural, and are strong or weak. The instrumental is vestigial and only used with the masculine and neuter singular and often replaced by the dative. Only pronouns and strong adjectives retain separate instrumental forms. There is also sparse early Northumbrian evidence of a sixth case, the locative. Adjectives agree with nouns in case, gender, number, and strong, or weak forms. Pronouns and sometimes participles agree in case, gender, and number. First person and second person personal pronouns occasionally distinguish dual number forms. The definite article s and its inflections serve as a definite article, a demonstrative adjective, and demonstrative pronoun. Other demonstratives are is, and in. These words inflect for case, gender, number. Adjectives have both strong and weak sets of endings, 
weak ones being used when a definite or possessive determiner is also present. Verbs conjugate for three persons, first, second, and third, two numbers, singular, plural, two tenses, present, and past, three moods, indicative, subjunctive, and imperative, and are strong or weak. Verbs have two infinitive forms, bear, and bound, and two participles, present, and past. The subjunctive has past and present forms. Finite verbs agree with subjects in person, and number. The future tense, passive voice, and other aspects are formed with compounds. Adpositions are mostly before but often after their object. If the object of an adposition is marked in the dative case, an adposition may conceivably be located anywhere in the sentence. Remnants of the Old English case system in modern English are in the forms of a few pronouns and in the possessive ending s, which derives from the masculine and neuter genitive ending es. The modern English plural ending s derives from the Old English as but the latter applied only to strong masculine nouns in the nominative and accusative cases, different plural endings were used in other instances. Old English nouns had grammatical gender, while modern English has only natural gender. Pronoun usage could reflect either natural or grammatical gender when those conflicted, as in the case of WF, a neuter noun referring to a female person. In Old English's verbal compound constructions are the beginnings of the compound tenses of Modern English. Old English verbs include strong verbs, which form the past tense by altering the root vowel, and weak verbs, which use a suffix such as de. As in Modern English, and peculiar to the Germanic languages, the verbs form two great classes, weak, and strong. Like today, Old English had fewer strong verbs, and many of these have over time decayed into weak forms. Then, as now, dental suffixes indicated the past tense of the weak verbs, as in work and worked. Old English syntax is similar to that of modern English. Some differences are consequences of the greater level of nominal and verbal inflection, allowing freer word order. Old English was first written in runes, using the Futhorka rune set derived from the Germanic 24-character Elder Futhark, extended by five more runes used to represent Anglo-Saxon vowel sounds, and sometimes by several more additional characters. From around the 9th century, the runic system came to be supplanted by a half unsheal script of the Latin alphabet introduced by Irish Christian missionaries. This was replaced by insular script, a cursive and pointed version of the half unsheal script. This was used until the end of the 12th century when continental Carolingian minuscule replaced the insular. The Latin alphabet of the time still lacked the letters J and W and there was no V as distinct from U. Moreover native Old English spellings did not use K, Q, or Z. The remaining 20 Latin letters were supplemented by four more, A and, which were modified Latin letters, and Thorn and Win, which are borrowings from the Futhork. A few letter pairs were used as digraphs, representing a single sound. Also used was the Tyronean note for the conjunction and, and a thorn with a crossbar through the ascender for the pronoun t. Macrons over vowels were originally used not to mark long vowels, but to indicate stress, or as abbreviations for a following m or n. Modern editions of Old English manuscripts generally introduce some additional conventions. The modern forms of Latin letters are used, including G in place of the insular G, S for long S, and others which may differ considerably from the insular script, notably E, F and R. 
Macrons are used to indicate long vowels, where usually no distinction was made between long and short vowels in the originals. Additionally, modern editions often distinguish between velar and palatal C and G by placing dots above the palatals. The letter WIN is usually replaced with W, but ESC, ETH and THORN are normally retained. In contrast with modern English orthography, that of Old English was reasonably regular, with a mostly predictable correspondence between letters and phonemes. There were not usually any silent letters in the word knit, for example, both the C and H were pronounced, unlike the K and GH in the modern night. The following table lists the Old English letters and digraphs together with the phonemes they represent, using the same notation as in the phonology section above. Doubled consonants are geminated, the geminate fricative slash, FF and SS cannot be voiced. Old English literature, though more abundant than literature of the continent before AD 1000, is nonetheless scant. The pagan and Christian streams mingle in Old English, one of the richest and most significant bodies of literature preserved among the early Germanic peoples. In his supplementary article to the 1935 posthumous edition of Bright's Anglo-Saxon Reader, Dr. James Hulbert writes, In such historical conditions, an incalculable amount of the writings of the Anglo-Saxon period perished. What they contained, how important they were for an understanding of literature before the conquest, we have no means of knowing. The scant catalogues of monastic libraries do not help us, and there are no references in extant works to other compositions. How incomplete our materials are can be illustrated by the well known fact that, with few and relatively unimportant exceptions, all extant Anglo Saxon poetry is preserved in four manuscripts. Some of the most important surviving works of Old English literature are Beowulf an epic poem, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a record of early English history, the Frank's Casket, an inscribed early whalebone artifact, and Cadman's Hymn, a Christian religious poem. There are also a number of extant prose works, such as Sermons and Saints' Lives, Biblical translations and translated Latin works of the early Church Fathers, legal documents, such as laws and wills, and practical works on grammar, medicine, and geography. Still, poetry is considered the heart of Old English literature. Nearly all Anglo-Saxon authors are anonymous, with a few exceptions, such as Bede and Cadman. Cadman, the earliest English poet we know by name, served as a lay brother in the monastery at Whitby. The first example is taken from the opening lines of the folk epic Beowulf, a poem of some 3,000 lines and the single greatest work of Old English. This passage describes how Hrothgar's legendary ancestor Scyld was found as a baby, washed ashore, and adopted by a noble family. The translation is literal and represents the original poetic word order. As such, it is not typical of Old English prose. The modern cognates of original words have been used whenever practical to give a close approximation of the feel of the original poem. The words in brackets are implied in the Old English by noun case and the bold words in brackets are explanations of words that have slightly different meanings in a modern context. Notice how what is used by the poet where a word like lo or behold would be expected. This usage is similar to what ho, both an expression of surprise and a call to attention. English poetry is based on stress and alliteration. In alliteration, the first consonant in a word alliterates with the same consonant at the beginning of another word, as with ga with macron ardina and ardagum. Vowels alliterate with any other vowel, 
as with a e elan gas and elan. In the text below, the letters that alliterate are bolded. A semi-fluent translation in modern English would be Lo. We have heard of majesty of the Spear Danes, of those nation kings in the days of yore, and how those noblemen promoted zeal. Scyld Safing took away mead benches from bands of enemies, from many tribes, he terrified earls. Since he was first found destitute he grew under the heavens, prospered in honors, until each of those who lived around him over the sea had to obey him, give him tribute. That was a good king. This text of the Lord's Prayer is presented in the standardized West Saxon literary dialect, with added macrons for vowel length, markings for probable polytalist consonants, modern punctuation, and the replacement of the letter win with W. This is a proclamation from King Nut the Great to his Earl Thorkel the Tall and the English people written in AD 1020. Unlike the previous two examples, this text is prose rather than poetry. For ease of reading, the passage has been divided into sentences while the pill crows represent the original division. Like other historical languages, Old English has been used by scholars and enthusiasts of later periods to create texts either imitating Anglo-Saxon literature or deliberately transferring it to a different cultural context. Examples include Alastair Campbell and J.R.R. Tolkien. A number of websites devoted to modern paganism and historical reenactment offer reference material and forums promoting the active use of Old English. There is also an Old English version of Wikipedia. However, one investigation found that many Neo-Old English texts published online bear little resemblance to the historical language and have many basic grammatical mistakes.